it's the band people have been hoping for, I think. It's nice of them to come across the pond. We get a win in the championship series. Ministers, the biggest component. A childhood dream always come here and plays. Oh, this is a great venue to play at, definitely. Um, it's huge. Everyone knows about the Hollywood Bowl. Thanks a lot for giving us one of the best concerts we've ever had, you know, so... It's a massive task. It's been a bit like hanging on the back of a rocket, really, while a rocket's taken off. It's getting all very rock and roll, you know, to the point where we can have our own private chartered plane every now and again. We're looking at one, two, three. Oh, my Lord. It's really like a phenomenon how it's elevated so greatly, you know. Closest kickers! Check out the shirts over here! We were probably the most uh, testing gigs of our lives, I think. Mainly because we had to play and dodge flying objects at the same time. <laughs> Hello, I'm Chris, the singer of the band Coldplay. Welcome to the ticking of clocks, the losing of plots, the story of Coldplay in America. Listen to how much we've turned into total wankers. Bye. <laughs> I think that Coldplay single is beautiful. Stuff like that never really catches in America. I wish it would, because I think people need to redis rediscover their sensitive side rather than their brute caveman dynamic. When Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters spoke of Coldplay cracking America almost three years ago, not even he could have predicted how the fairy tale would unravel. With the fleeting exceptions of people like Oasis and Radiohead, it's almost two decades since a British band has impacted on the land of the free in the way that Coldplay are doing right now. And no, this isn't exaggerated optimism, and it's not another attempt at hyping the Brits abroad. I can tell you Coldplay are conquering the States, where so many British bands have failed, because I've seen it with my own eyes. And it is an extraordinary story. May 2003, Coldplay start their biggest American and Canadian tour to date. Three weeks from coast to coast, including two sellout shows at the Hollywood Bowl and a gig at New York's Madison Square Gardens, which sold out in just five minutes. Where so many British bands in the last decade have failed, Coldplay look finally set to succeed in breaking the states. But what's the story on the road and behind the headlines? Can you hear that A week into the tour, we're at the Hollywood Bowl on a Monday afternoon. It's about uh, 20 past four as people set up for tonight's show. Doors open in about an hour. This is the second of two sellout dates at the 18,000 capacity National Amphitheatre. Uh, the first one brought out such stars as Brian Wilson and uh, a couple of the Red Hot Chili Peppers. The group themselves have just finished sound checking here. Uh, I've got a copy of the Los Angeles Daily Times. Dated June the 2nd, today's paper with a review of Saturday's gig. And uh, it says here, comparing uh, Chris Martin to Bono, it says, at the Hollywood Bowl on Saturday, Coldplay's Chris Martin seems to be fitted for a halo as he led the English band through a set of its grand, classically proportioned ballads. We'll hopefully see what they mean later on tonight. You know, they're a different brand of music. You don't really hear a lot of bands like them in, in America, basically. There's really nothing on that CD that I don't like. Just enjoy their music and listen to it at home, in the car, wherever. There's all ages that enjoy their music. I got on the internet as soon as the tickets went on sale at 10 a.m. like four months ago. Yeah, I kind of wish that they'd stay small though. It's like the more Coldplay concerts I go to, the farther back I'm getting. I read where they're talking about St. Bono and Chris Martin might possibly be the next saint. And put a smile upon your face. Best time of your life, so. Guitarist Johnny Buckland. They're very vocal audiences, you know, and very few other countries in the world has audiences that whoop. You know, when you're doing like these ra little radio gigs and stuff, they kind of whoop after every sentence or, you know, half a sentence. It's quite strange. Bassist Guy Berryman. Hollywood Bowl was pretty special, really, because, you know, everyone's played there and the Beatles, and it's a very historical venue. Looking Earth from out of space Everyone has found the place Will Champion There are occasions when you get to meet like people that, that mean something to you and I think the, the Brian Wilson coming into our dressing room was amazing in fact he's just dropped off a CD of something that he wants us to, to be on I think and, and that's, you know, that kind of thing is amazing I Do you appreciate how much bigger you're getting 
over here? Has it sunk in, your increased popularity? Uh, no, not really. I mean, people tell us we're getting bigger, but we're just doing what we do, you know. And the penny never drops, it kind of falls in lots of little stages. But it's nice to have, you know, come over, to have started touring in America with an objective to sort of cracking it and to sort of start seeing that that might actually be happening. Can you hear the audience when they start singing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, my monitors are pretty loud, but... Um, you can, if they're singing really loud, you can definitely hear it. It's probably, if not quite the greatest feeling, then uh, probably the second greatest feeling it's possible to have. What's the greatest one, then? Uh, watching Spurs win the cup final. <laughs> <laughs> But as they say, there is no sleep for the not-so-wicked. Straight after the gig, there's the obligatory star-studded after-show party near the famous Chateau Marmont Hotel, frequented by the likes of Steven Spielberg and exiled pop stars including Tim Burgess from The Charlatans. With that out of the way, the band grab a few hours' kip ahead of the influential K-Rock breakfast show. Time, 8am. Location, House of Blues, Sunset Strip, Los Angeles. Guy Berryman again. In LA, there's a there's a station called K Rock, which has really been, um, you know, they've been the, the sort of leaders of getting us onto the radio stations over here. Because basically, what happens is if one influential radio station will put us on, then the rest will copy that, and it's sort of like a domino effect. And uh, we're, we're very lucky to have some fans at K Rock that have really, you know, pushed us. Are you as surprised as as everybody else? Might be? We always knew the next <laughs> I'm Estelle, and I'm one of the band's managers. How important is uh, radio play here, radio stations like K-Rock? Incredibly important. Key, I'd say, at the beginning and, and throughout. What do you think it was about Coldplay that attracted K-Rock to them? Because they were, um, really were one of the first British bands to actually be championed at, uh, you know, two, three years ago. Well, they were obviously ready for a change. The music wouldn't be you know, a success with the fans and, and, and wouldn't go down well if nobody wanted to hear it. So they were obviously had enough of what was being played and, and wanted to hear something different. Do you think there's a certain element of right place, right time to Coldplay success? Uh, of course, there, there has to be. You know, there's many analogies you can use, but the pieces of the pie, there's, you know, you've got to have everything in place at that time. And some bands miss out on certain elements. Maybe they don't get radio play. Maybe they're not prepared at all. There's so many different elements that come in and you just have to make everything try and fit into place as you go along. Chris Martin. We play the game where we meet and greet, which is the key over in America. We meet people and we shake people's hands and that's cool because as far as we're concerned, it's just like when we see you, we say, you know, thanks a lot for playing our first single, you know. It's just the same over here except you have to it's just a little more official. Johnny Buckland again. Playing the game to us means doing the kind of those, those acoustic sessions for radio stations and the big radio festivals where we're uh, in the between, you know, um, the disturbed or something, you know, something incredibly heavy rock. We get objects thrown at us. <laughs> the ones on the East Coast in Washington and, and Boston were, uh, were probably the most uh, testing gigs of our lives, I think. Mainly because you had to play and dodge flying objects at the same time. <laughs> Anything particularly scary being thrown at you? What is it? L liquid? Well, bottles of su suspicious looking liquid. <laughs> it's the only time I've spent the whole gig without looking at my guitar once, you know. <laughs> you seem like you're so nice and well fun. After the radio show, there's more good news for the boys. The A&R team who first signed them to BMG Publishing have flown out to witness just how far things have moved on. Hi, I'm Caroline Ellery from BMG Publishing. I'm Ian Ramage from BMG Publishing. Are all the things that you see in the bands now, and probably the reasons why they're becoming successful in America, are they all the things that you saw in them initially? Um, well, I've just had girls crying because they want uh, autographs from the band, which is really weird when you've known them since they were students and they're kind of not at all the kind of heartthrobs that, that they've become. But they've always had qualities that I thought would take them through to be 
ginormous. There's not a secret to it, but they're just very, very grounded and real, and they've been consistent to their own personalities throughout. And that, especially in here in the, the American market, that really comes through. I mean, I thought that interview that we just witnessed on the K Rock thing, that was reminiscent of the Beatles thing, the sort of the, the genuine off the cuff wit thing. It really is charming, it's endearing, and you can. People get it for the right reasons. When you're doing that, as well as being, you know, the most original, most exciting new band around, you can see why it's why it's working the way it is. I think. Do you think they can go to the size of somebody like a U2? Almost certainly. I think the next album will just absolutely blow our minds. Just hearing a couple of songs that they played live last night at the Hollywood Bowl, Moses. I've heard it twice now, and and you, it's registered completely. The the songwriting is always evolving, and I think they're going to amaze with their next album. I think it'll be incredible. I thought the, the second show last night was the best performance for me I'd ever seen them give. I really did think it's a massive task, but there was the, that X factor last night. Absolutely glorious, the heritage of the place, the whole, especially English bands coming and playing it, specifically the Beatles. They actually rose to that challenge gracefully and did it in their own way. That's why it's working. It's distinct and it's original and they're Coldplay. Oh, Thank you. So with countless more autographs signed and a few more hands shaken, the Coldplay Cavalcade sets off from California, heading through Utah and into Colorado. Going to continue to trigger some showers and thunderstorms, and we're also finding the storms as we head toward the Gulf Coast with, still with scattered thunderstorms on Sunday and Monday. Now, this isn't just simply a case of jumping on the bus anymore. Touring the States at this level is a massive operation. I'm Jeff Gray. I'm Coldplay's tour manager. We've now got five trucks, four buses, four backline techs who look after the equipment on, to, on stage. We've got our usual sort of sound engineers, but then augmented by PA riggers. The same with our two lighting designers. We've then got you know American lampies out with us. Then we've got the truck drivers, the bus drivers, assistants, 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 and several clowns. The budget's growing, you know, to the point where we can have our own private chartered plane every now and again. Um, it's getting all very rock and roll. Have you done this? You've done the chartered plane? Yeah, we flew down to LA in one the other night. Met on the runway by the cars, you know, the full proper rock star, you know, image. You had the police escort yet? Oh yeah, virtually every night. It's a, it's a necessity. Gives oh, them something to do. What's your biggest headache? Um, Chris Martin. <laughs> where he is, what he's doing why he isn't where he's meant to be and uh, it's like uh, it's, with the band me, we, me and the band security were talking about this it's like having a bag of marbles and as soon as you drop it they all scatter to four different corners what you mean this is what it's like when you lose your marbles yeah exactly <laughs> this is a bit different to playing Leicester Charlotte well yeah back then it was me and Dan the sound engineer and that was it but it was still fun though obviously yeah I'd love to go back to doing it like that again it can be arranged <laughs> Oh, the heady days of the Princess Charlotte in Leicester. Let's not forget, Coldplay have come a long way in a frighteningly short space of time. Think about it. From their first radio session as an unsigned band on Lamac Live to the Hollywood Bowl in just three years. That's incredible. Pleased to meet you. <laughs> Hope you know my name. Just think of In The City. And we were the tiniest band there. And we got in for a mate of a mate of a mate. There literally was about 200 people crammed into there. We went down to the Maid of Ale Studios. I couldn't believe it. I started sweating. Steve Lamack, Steve Lamack, Steve Lamack. Radio. I'm Will. He's Chris and that's John. I'm Chris. And, and, and that's Will. <laughs> He's John. Radio. Jesus, man. We, we've made it into the charts. The NME had an article on bands to look out for. So I read through and it's like Bellatrix, Gay Dad, Coldplay, Elbert. So I stopped and I nearly fell off my chair. And Alan McGee's having a go in The Guardian. Rock and roll's Aggie Portman. Rock and roll is Liam Gallagher. But it ain't Coldplay. I was in the shower in a hotel in Sicily when I heard that the album had gone at number one. Behind, backstage. Backstage. Behind the other stage at Glastonbury. Just excellent. They're really talented people. They are the sound of every heartbreak you've ever had. We're a bit nervous, to be honest. But we have got the will to succeed. Look at the stars. Shine for you and all the things 
Meanwhile, back in 2003, as the Coldplay party makes its way towards Denver, talk turns to their newfound star status. Can you have more fun or is it less fun the bigger you get? Oh, nothing's changed really. I mean, we just we just do what we do on tour and we have a good time and, you know, we might have the, have the biggest show in our life the next day, but it's not going to stop us going out and staying up all night, you know, the night before. It's sort of, I don't think we've ever really worked like that. I cannot quite believe how our lives are. That's why we're going to really pull our fingers out. It hits you at gigs, something like Amsterdam. I get to walk off stage and relax for a few minutes while Chris is doing his thing. And, uh, and that's when it really hits home. You can kind of watch everything that's going on. You can watch the audience, you can watch the stage, you know. But yeah, it's just kind of weird. I mean, that was our biggest headline gig, you know, and, and uh, I just couldn't believe it, really. <laughs> I'd not be stuck here in this hole. I wake up in my palatial suite and I <laughs> run myself a milk bath and, you know, think, how, do, how the hell did I get here from my uh, scummy little flat in Camden? And I, and I still live in a scummy little flat in Camden. <laughs> it's kind of a big come down when I come home, you know. But I am screaming underneath. Has the chemistry of the band changed at all over the years? I don't know, we've got a lot closer, I reckon. We, we've got, as the years get, roll on, I can't, we just know each other a lot better. And, we know how to piss each other off and we know how to, to make each other feel better as well, you know. It's a fine art, the art of annoying someone to the point where they're trying to lash out, it's great. <laughs> Guy is the most mischievous. He does the, just elbowing in the ribs and prodding and things like that. But no, they've all, we all have our little weaknesses, <laughs> which all of us know about. I got really ratty about an hour ago because whenever, whenever anyone's asleep in the dressing room, I always make sure that I'm quiet around them. And I was trying to sleep in the dressing room and everyone just burst in going... <laughs> <laughs> and I went, Fuck it. I just lost my rag a bit and shouted at people. So, you know, just general inconsideration of humans <laughs> pisses me off. How much have you become more relaxed in yourself over the last six months? I think the things I worry about are changing. It's hard not to get hippy dippy on everything, you know? I mean, everybody keeps dying or they keep being war on and there's just a lot to make you depressed. Not depressed, but I, I mean as in we don't just walk around thinking, wow, we're, you know, we're the greatest thing, you know? The way I see it, we've been given an enormous musical udder and we have to milk it very hard. Does that mean you stopped worrying about bad reviews and moved on to something more important? Of course not. A bad review is still as... The bigger a balloon gets, it doesn't take a bigger pin to pop it. Hi, I'm Johnny. And I'm Will, and you're listening to Ticking of Clocks, the Coldplay in America documentary. Coldplay arrived to play Red Rocks, a huge amphitheatre hewn into the mountains towering above the Mile High City, on June the 5th, 2003. 20 years to the very day a then emerging Irish band played the very same venue, filmed the gig and created a small slice of rock history Red Rock, does that hold any real significance to you? Obviously for a lot of people it's where you two recorded Under a Blood Red Sky Everyone tells me that it's the most beautiful venue in America so just bearing that in mind then it's, it's going to be a good gig hopefully hey, of course, it's just coincidence that you arrived in Red Rocks 20 years to the day after oh, you two. Well, it was coincidence because I didn't know about that until until you told me. Manager Estelle Wilkinson. I think I was actually the the last person to, to read that because as I was reading it, I was thinking, "What's he out? Did no one tell me about this?" Because there are elements that are similar, and why learn from your mistakes when you can possibly learn from other people's success or mistakes? I think our job is basically to remind people that they like you too, or Radiohead, or Travis. Shut up now. No, stop. Well, I'm not, I have no shame in saying it. Why not? This is the thing, you know, when you get four great cricket players or footballers, people celebrate all of them. We plagiarise off everybody that we like. Brian Eno is the new one, you know, or The Cure. I wish we could cover that song, A Forest. That's my favourite song ever. Oh, I mean, Guy would love that, wouldn't he? He yeah. gets to do this. Ding, ding. Do, do, do. Ding, ding. Do, do. Oh, yeah, what, in the, the end? Yeah, right. Yes. Come to Red Sea. Sing to the trees. 
find a girl when you can. <laughs> On the hour-long drive to the venue from Coldplay's Hotel in downtown Denver, the band's tour bus is consistently pursued by autograph hunters. Uh, we're in a people carrier en route to Red Rocks um, with two of Coldplay. We've got Guy and Will with us. At this point in the evening, do you start getting nervous? I get Probably when, when we get into the, uh, the actual place, we'll get there. But as we're in traffic at the moment, I'm just I'm not really nervous, you know. Are you, are you ad adapting to uh, this American on-the-road life? You know, we've got a routine now, I think, you know, we, we, on days off we found things that we like to do. I like to go and buy um, old records and find pawn shops and buy, like, vintage stuff. I just like buying... P-A-W-N. <laughs> yeah. Which is, um, it's bad because in America they pronounce it pawn. So whenever I say, uh, go to, to the concierge, uh, excuse me, is there any pawn shops nearby? They say, <laughs> what did you say? Shaking their finger at me. <laughs> Well, I, I guess we're about five minutes away, but already, that, I mean, that's incredible. It does look, I mean, it looks like, over the one side you've got something which looks like it's out of an old western film or something, and over here you're in the highlands of Scotland. Oh, we are in another traffic jam. Are we jump in the queue? Yeah, I think it's allowed. It's our gig. That fellow who was um, trying to get his album cover signed, he'll catch us up at any second. Because yeah. out actually en route here we had a guy who was trailing us for about three blocks and every t every uh, set of traffic lights he stopped ran out of the car and then started waving an album sleeve at the band you know there, there are people here who look like they're into all sorts of music rock metal but you seem to have won over well i don't know i think maybe fans of all types of music are into songs and honesty and i don't know it's, it's kind of cheesy to talk about why you think you're so great but we think we're great and and it's great that other people agree with us, so there you go. Couldn't agree more myself. Great band, great people carrier, great that you gave us a lift here, and it's great that we've just arrived in the car park by the backstage area. Hi, this is Guy from Coldplay, and you're listening to The Ticking of Clocks, Coldplay in America. At Red Rocks, the backstage area is in a series of caves, and to make things all the more surreal, there's talk of snowstorms wreaking havoc later on. We're sitting backstage, uh, the clouds are gathering, and it does look like the weather is going to be pretty poor. We've got rain hats for all the boys on stage. Because of the high winds, we can't use the screens tonight, so we're going to improvise and project straight onto the rocks of the amphitheatre. Behind the scenes, however, everything is calm, with the wider Coldplay family apparently in full control. Uh, hello, this is Derek Fudge. I am production manager for Coldplay. I look after uh, the lights, the sound, the crew, the transport, the hotels. Um, I'm the person they blame when it all goes wrong. How have you seen it sort of grow, particularly in America? It's been a bit like hanging on the back of a rocket, really, while a rocket's taken off. We, we started doing uh, little shows, sort of uh, three or five hundred people coming up for a year ago, and it's just gone up and up and up, and we're all still every day pinching ourselves and not really believing what's going on and, and just trying to enjoy it at, at, at the same time, but just still in uh, total disbelief, really. And the band are enjoying themselves because they have put in a lot of hard work, and it's what they've all, always wanted. <laughs> Yes, sir. Never off duty. There don't seem to be any red shirts whatsoever on the stage. There are lots of red shirts under Rain Max. If you call for red shirts, they'll come running. Over. <laughs> what about your highlights of this tour so far? Highlights of this tour, uh, definitely, obviously, the Hollywood Bowl. I'm sure anybody else you've talked to has said that. Because it was a, a completely different show for us. It wasn't our normal touring show because of the nature of the venue. Looking forward to doing Madison Square Gardens and, uh, well, obviously from the U2 video that a lot of us grew up with. It was a, a childhood dream almost to come here and play. So, yeah. Been... Same weather. Uh, unfortunately, the same weather tonight, yes, but never mind. Wind drops keep falling on my head. But that doesn't mean the sky is always turning red Keep falling on my head That doesn't mean let's sing this song I'm Ron Sexsmith and uh, we're at the Red Rocks Amphitheater in Denver I'm opening up for these Coldplay boys The loudest It's a very impressive show 
it just seems to be a different show every time in a way you know this seems much more of a rock show now there's a lot more energy there's a lot more sort of guitar than even on the records I think you know and obviously with the, with the bigger venues the light show gets bigger and the screens they're a really good band with great melodic songs you know intelligent arrangements it seems that probably people were sort of starving for something like that to come along and they just sort of happened at the right time because I think obviously Radiohead's a great band but they're a little more left to center and you know they sometimes they get a bit arty and Coldplay is a little more direct with their songs I think it, as a result it's going to touch more people in a way you know they're the right band it's the band people have been hoping for I think Miles away from the big media industry, Red Rocks understandably hasn't attracted the same amount of celebs as Hollywood. But that's good. The band are far more relaxed. And after wandering over to our table, Chris finally takes time out to answer the million dollar question. Just what is it like dating Gwyneth Paltrow? This is a song about when you, when you really um, mess up with your girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever you have in Denver. This is the only time we're ever going to talk about this, so... When you have a high-profile girlfriend, people forget that really she's like, well, like everyone, Jack Nicholson or the Pope, they're just people with parents and worries and, you know what I mean? We're a high-profile band now, but we don't feel any different. People might treat us differently when they meet us, but after 10 minutes with anybody, you realise you either like them or you don't, you know, that the initial thing of fame is very uh, short-lived and, you know, it doesn't really mean anything. And what is a picture of Jude Law coming out of the supermarket? mean he's like a normal guy you know in, an, in a parallel universe it'd be accountants that the people that get photographed it's just a weird thing i mean i'd worry if you'd gone mad but i don't think you have i don't know i'm, I'm sure our next album will get panned to the rafters that's the chris martin i know and love get in <laughs> i'm sure it will though there's so much to hate about us now that if i was a writer i would basically have an ak-47 in one hand and a pen in the other and not be quite sure which one i wanted to use most the best cure for coldness is singing a cold play song And they sprung And then there are the claims in the press that the band and Gwynny don't quite see eye to eye. Will Champion again. That's, that's their business. It's just another cool person. Like It's just like having my girlfriend out on tour, you know? It's just no biggie. In the same vein, we were at the Bull and Gate, whenever it was, or at the Camden Falcon. Our manager came back and said, F me, Steve Malak's in the audience. So we were like, wow! You know, so, you know. But, but you never slept with me. Shh. We tried. <laughs> we tried. Anything to get our records played on your radio station. I see trees of green. Red rocks too. The snow may have stayed away, but boy, did it rain. A torrential downpour which lasted for virtually the entire hour and a half that the band were on stage. But the endearing personality of Chris Martin, the ever ad-living frontman, and the increasingly familiar material shine through. The Denver audience, and I have to say, the Denver audience soaked to the skin, stayed and smiled and sang and bought into a band whose lack of pretension, work ethic and self-effacing character has given British pop music new hope in the States. I see the way it's been raining Your enthusiasm's not been changing You're treated as nice And so we might do a encore twice Yes, I feel too much What's more, the new material, including Moses and World Turned Upside Down, really bodes well for the future. So as the group set off with Chicago and New York's Madison Square Gardens lying in wait, we bade our farewells, leaving behind a band running into the eye of the storm, with all the right protective clothing on. Thanks a lot, please look at MakeTradeFair.com, see you later, goodbye. What's the challenge for you now, though? What, what, yeah, when you wake up in the mornings. I, can't stand the rain. I mean, the challenge is everything. The challenge is to validate everybody who's yep. said they liked us. The challenge is to not fuck up and become some washed-up cocaine band. The challenge is to produce the best music of all time. The challenge is to change the mainstream of music and help change even things outside of music, like the fair trade stuff. 
the challenge is to like excite young people or old people about music or the, the challenge is to make the most of our lives. There's a feeling that we've, we've kind of reached the end of one stage of our journey and we're, we're maybe about to start at the beginning of something else. There is a definite feeling of that, but where we go from here, I'm not quite sure. What, musically or just as a band? Well, yeah, just in every way, you know, musically, the, the, you know, the songs that we're writing and like, for instance, what we're going to do touring-wise on the next album because we have to try and step it up another level, but what is there to do? You know, we're doing all these big venues already. Everywhere we go and everything we go through, it's hilarious that we haven't had to really change anything about what we do too much, except that we've just got more and more into music. I mean, it's so funny to turn around and it's Will back behind me and Johnny there and Guy there. I mean, this is the same four people that were playing, you know, in the Manchester Roadhouse to like 15 people, you know, four years ago. And it always will be the same four people, even when we're back at the Roadhouse, you know, after the next album. It's going to be difficult to get our production in there. I think you might have to Where the hell's the chef going to go? <laughs>